Okay, I have uh, just a couple quick things, uh, nothing major, but uh, number one, um, I posted the little PowerPoint involving flumazenil on my website. Actually, Clinton did. <laughs> so it is available if you'd like to look at it. And number two, I got an email, uh, thank you for sending it, um, regarding uh, porphyria and ketamine. Because my literature, textbook and workbook and so on, says ketamine is safe. And other anesthesia books say ketamine is not safe. And that discrepancy was pointed out to me, and it is in fact real. And so I did a little exploring. And uh, actually, let me show you. The uh, the New England Journal of Medicine did a thing on Porphyria, a review article. You can see from August 31st of this year, so it's only a few weeks old. And they have their chart, which I marked, and they are extremely not helpful because. <laughs> If you can see, <laughs> this is what they say. Possibly unsafe. Here it is here. Ketamine. Possibly unsafe. <laughs> well, that really gives you a lot of clinical guidance, doesn't it? Possibly unsafe. So that wasn't much of a help. Um, uh, also, I looked in. Uh, uh, Complications of Anesthesia textbook, which just came out this week, in fact, third edition, and it's Dr. Fleischer. And uh, he says uh, unsafe. Anyways, uh, to make a long story short, I looked at the uh, American Porphyria Association Foundation. They all, everybody has a website, you know. And it was very helpful. They have a list of do's and don'ts and so on. And they list both the American and the European Porphyria Association's list, ketamine is not safe. So, with that in mind, we got a possibly unsafe, not safe, and safe. So I would say I would go towards the foundation and because they follow it on a day-to-day -day basis. And if they say it's unsafe, I would say it's unsafe. So I'm going to amend, and I'll have to change my textbook, amend uh, what we learned and that is in the induction drugs that the etomidate was the one that was unsafe and now we should add ketamine to that probably. So I would say both etomidate and ketamine where I'm adding to the unsafe. I'm going farther than possibly unsafe. You gotta, you gotta make a decision so we'll make a decision to say don't give it. Okay, now next. Um, let me uh, Go to page 213. Yesterday we started the opiates and um, so backtracking a little bit to uh, page 215. We said there are several endogenous chemicals that are analgesic in nature uh, in the body and uh, uh, they've been named over the years uh, to be in keflins, metanolone and keflin, the endorphins primarily beta endorphin, and the dynorphins, those are the three major groups of analgesic chemicals the body uses. There's some other experimental or still investigative, the endomorphins and so on, but we won't worry about that. Then we uh, mentioned that uh, on page uh, 218, there's three prominent groups of opiate receptors, subtypes, and they are mu, the main opiate receptor, kappa and delta, with a little bit of variation in function, uh, but they have very sim more similarities than differences. And the, uh, the neural axis in the GI system, which contains the vast majority, almost all of the opiate receptors, will have a combination of all three receptors and some Keflins, endorphins, or dynorphins 
are more prominent in one part of the brain or spinal cord than the other part. Or some receptors are more prominent here or there. But it just adds complexity to the situation, which the human body likes in some respects, because then you can have a more varied response. So uh, it's too tedious to worry about which receptors in which part of the brain and which is the main uh, body's endogenous uh, uh, stimulant. Uh, we, for us clinicians, we just need to know there's opiate receptors in the brain, spinal cord, and GI system. We'll talk about them. And that's where the drugs work. Now, we went through the mechanism of action, page 219, and that was that uh, enkephalin, endorphin, and dynorphin containing neurons squirt their transmitter onto pain pathways and opiate receptors in those pain pathways and the stimulation of the opiate receptors causes a decrease in the secretion of pain chemicals, pain producing chemicals, uh, whatever that chemical may be in that particular <coughs> part of the neuroaxis. So I thought that was pretty straightforward. And then went to page uh, 121, looked at the basic uh, pharmacologic effects, and we're going to go through each one of these in detail, on page 221, but what do new receptors do, what do CAP and what do, uh, do delta receptors do, and again, we'll go through each of these effects and why they happen and how they happen and where they happen, etc. But there's the basic action of uh, any narcotic, uh, analgesia, euphoria, sedation, dependence, Respiratory depression, of course, big. Meiosis, constipation, urinary retention, bradycardia, paritis, skeletal muscle rigidity, uh, and biliary spasm. And an anti shivering effect. So, and we'll go through these as we go along. We uh, mentioned on 222 that there's three classifications of narcotics full agonists, partial agonists, antagonists and of course antagonists like Narcan. So they can be classified into three different groups as far as efficacy goes and the more common way to classify them is on the next page that is according to the chemical class and that is the natural occurring drugs, financering alkaloids, that's morphine and codeine, then the semi-synthetic drugs, that is they take the basic financering structure and then just Tweak, tweak it a little bit around here, there, and everywhere, and come up with semi-synthetic drugs, and that's heroin, Vicodin, Dilaudid, and Oxycontin. Uh, but they're all financing derivatives. Uh, the others are phenylpaparidines, that's Demerol, Meparidine, and uh, Fentanyl, Sue Allen, Remy. And uh, this is third group <coughs> method. There's actually a couple more groups, but it, uh, Art didn't put them on here because they really don't relate to us at all. Uh, but a third group he does mention that does relate to us, and that's of course methadone. And uh, methadone is used for uh, maintenance of, uh, op now the new word is opiate use disorder. This is what all the books are calling it. This is for drug dependence. So it's for maintenance of that, trying to get withdrawal. Uh, or in anesthesia, methadone is used a lot for chronic pain situations in pain clinics because of its long duration of action and it's pretty good to absorb orally, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk more about that. Now the thing about the classification, oh, and Jillian asked me a question yesterday about tramadol. What is that classified? And it's a semi-synthetic financing. So there you go. We'll talk about tramadol later too. Um, the phenanthrines release histamine, and Amaral does, the rest don't. And as far as allergies, there's within-class allergies. If you're allergic to one phenanthrine, you're allergic to them all. But there's not cross-class allergies, so you still can get a phenylpiperidine or a methadone if you're allergic to one of the phenanthrines, and vice versa, etc. So I think that's... And I also mentioned, of course, that it's very difficult to tell just by history 
if somebody's allergic because many of the effects, just the general usual effects of narcotics, mimic allergy. They're not really an allergy, they're just effects, including nausea and vomiting, pruritus, uh, uh, dysphoria, etc. So you have to, you sometimes can't tell too well. But you can always switch uh, classes. Then finally, I think on 224, we finished. And I was mentioning about potency and uh, the opiates, and you know the measurement of potency is pretty broadly defined. Uh, there is some general ideas, that being that everything's compared to morphine on page 224, morphine one milligram, and then what is everything else? And Demerol is one tenth the potency. Fentanyl is about a hundred times as potent. Sufenta is about five hundred times as potent. Alfenta about 10 to 20 times more potent, and Remifentanil about 100 times more potent. And then some of the other ones are listed as well. So that's a little difference in potency. And I think that's kind of where we left off. So if there are any questions, we can uh, stop, but uh, otherwise I'll plug on. <coughs> so I want to go to the next page, 225, and let's talk a little chemistry. Very little because there's not much to really talk about, but I'll go on the camera and point. And this is uh, morphine at the top. <laughs> You're ahead of me. This is morphine at the top, you can see. Maybe I'll pull it in the view better. And this is a financial nucleus. This one, two, three, four. You see their bridge here? That's called a financial nucleus. And you notice all these drugs have those four rings. And then the only difference is you take morphine as a prototype, and then you can develop heroin by putting acetyl groups here, and uh, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, oxycodone, hydromorphone is uh, ketone groups, etc. So you just change a few groups from the outside. I don't care if you know that. I'm not going to ask you that. But that's the basic financing structure and all the different semi-synthetic derivatives. If you look at the metabolism of this used morphine, it's a prototype on the next page, 226. Here's morphine and it undergoes well, it can undergo demethylation or glucuronide transferase enzyme conjugates it and you end up with morphine glucuronide here and here. So basically the narcotics, I'll use the morphine as an example. Uh, basically, it's easy. The narcotics are metabolized in the liver, like most drugs, and the metabolism is pretty straightforward. They're mostly conjugated glucuronic acid and eliminated as a phase two product. Hopefully that means something to you. And there's really not much to say about metabolism. If somebody has liver disease, you can expect any, most all, except for remifentanil, you can expect most all narcotics to last longer. The patient won't be, require as many doses, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's the fennel pipe hurtings on the next page. And again, I, I show you this, I don't care if you know it or not. But this is the basic structure for them. And you see they all have this similar ring structures. Fentanyl, sufentanil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the only difference is uh, remifentanil. And remifentanil was specifically designed by the uh, med chemists to have what's have this ester group in it, was remifentanil right here, so it could be hydrolyzed in the plasma. And so remifentanil is has a half life of just a couple of minutes. It has to be given by continuous infusion, or it goes away at about five minutes. So it's a fentanyl derivative, the same potency as fentanyl. It's basically fentanyl that you have to give by continuous infusion to keep it working. 
and for the obvious reason. And this way, when you turn the drip off, then the narcotic goes away and you can wake the patient up. So Remy Fentanyl has a duration of maximum of about five minutes. When you turn the diffusion pump off, the patient wears off. And we'll talk about it uh, next week, but when you give it and the patient, it all goes away before you wake the patient up, then you get better to give something for analgesia then, because you're going to wake up in pain uh, from their incision and the stuff you did to them. So you have to like plan for maybe give them a shot of fat, a dose of fentanyl or some, uh, some uh, acetaminophen or something. We'll talk about that next week. Anyways, these are the phenylpiperidines, and you can see alfenta, sufent, and fentanyl are also metabolized in the liver. There's nothing significant. The only exception to all that is Remy fentanyl, which is the only one that's hydrolyzed in the plasma. And its duration of action is short. We'll talk about the kinetics a little bit later today. I have a little thing about Remy fentanyl on the next page, if you care. I barely care. There's Remy fentanyl. And little ester groups in here. So you can metabolize it by hydrolysis and the metabolites then are inactive and it wears off very quickly. Now, a couple things. We're going to put this under narcotic metabolism because I don't know where else to put it. So I want to give you the highlights. And this is what I want you to know about it. Number one, as I just said, usually the metabolism is fairly Insignificant, it's just metabolized like most drugs, all narcotics in the liver, eliminated as conjugates, there's no issues with it, there you go. In somebody with liver disease, as expected with any drug that's metabolized in the liver, narcotics are no different, you can expect a prolonged duration of action. So that's point number one. That's pretty much pharmacology 101. Number two, Remy fentanyl is an exception. It's metabolized by hydrolysis. The enzymes catalyzing it are called nonspecific esterases. So just write that down for now. Remy fentanyl is metabolized by nonspecific esterases in the plasma. That's going to have tremendous meaning to you right after Christmas. So we're going to learn all about it next next when we do the, the local. I mean the. Muscle relaxants next. We'll learn all about colon esterase and nonspecific esterases and so on. So let's put it on the shelf in the holding pattern and just say that Remy fentanyl's broken down the plasma. The enzymes that catalyze it are nonspecific esterase enzymes, and the duration of action is about five minutes. Okay, so that's number two. Okay, let's go to page 218. Page 218. There's a little thing I put blurb in here. I took out of the, uh, here's the reference there on the bottom of page 218, uh, having to do with pharmacogenetics in the opiates. I thought this was kind of interesting. So I put this in here. So let's take a look at some of this. Uh, again, it's not earth shattering, but it's something to say. Uh, Acetylchrome enzymes that do metabolize the opiates, they're starting with uh, CYP2D6. They mention that codeine is a prodrug metabolized to its active form morphine. So what they're saying is codeine is not an active drug. You have to take it in the body, metabolize it into, codeine, into morphine, and then it's actually the morphine that does the trick. Excessive metabolizers may produce dangerously high levels of morphine and because of that I want to go to page 257. We're going to go off on the side and talk about that. Page 257. So here's a phenomenon that happened. And this is an article from the New England Journal 2013. 
uh, and it involves codeine, as you can see from the article's name on page 257, new evidence about an old drug, the risk with codeine after adenotonsillectomy. So what happened is, and we're not going to read this whole thing, but what happened was uh, kids had uh, TNA, they come to surgery for tonsils, a very common operation, not as common as it used to be, but nonetheless, you'll do a lot of tonsils in kids. And they were given codeine uh, post-op for pain. The idea behind using codeine was it's very weak, it's not very potent, so the chances of side effects are less than, you know, giving morphine or Demerol or fentanyl or some more potent opiate. However, uh, here's what happened. And the FDA came out and put a bulletin out. And you can see, I will just look at the beginning of this. During the past 10 years, efforts in <coughs> genomics have generated insights into the safety of drugs. Now, what happened is, let's go to the next page. They found out, or people, we now realize, that codeine, of course, is metabolized. Uh, and they're showing the metabolism here. Uh, 2D6 puts it into morphine, and the other root, one of the other roots, uh, inactivates it. And uh, there are genetic differences in the speed at which anybody, children included, at least it happened to be talking about kids, but adults too, uh, metabolize it. So there are fast metabolizers and slow metabolizers. And that's what they categorize them actually as. And what happened is, if the kid happened to be a fast metabolizer, it would metabolize a lot more of the codeine into morphine than you would expect. They ended up with a high level of morphine, they got respiratory depressed, and they got problems. So these kids were getting codeine post-op for the very reason that you expected there to be less respiratory depression, and they ended up with more respiratory depression. And it's all because they were genetically in a small group of what is referred to as fast metabolizers. And that's what this little article is about. Now, the, uh, uh, on the last page there it says, the FDA requires manufacturers of all codeine containing products to add a boxed warning labeling the product that describes the risk posed by codeine in children after they've gone uh, at a TNA. Now, you worry about with TNA because, of course, it's airway surgery, and if they have respiratory depression, they already got bleeding and swollen airway and secretions, and they're spitting up uh, blood that's old blood from the TNA, etc. <coughs> so, as they say, performing routine genotyping before prescribing coding is not recommended because, well, it costs too much money, and what are you going to do? Take a kid in and do a, a genetic testing? to see if they're fast or slow metabolizer. I mean, it's all academically interesting, but it's not practical on a clinical basis. So patients with normal genotype results may still be at risk. Anyways, you get the point. There was a small group of patients who were considered fast metabolizers, and they had a problem. Now, if you go to page 260, next page, this is a repeat of the table. Let's look what it says. Codeine is a prodrug metabolized in its active, to its active form morphine. Extensive metabolizers may produce dangerously high levels of morphine. So there's a small group of children and adults. This doesn't just pertain to kids. But the problem happened mostly in kids because they were the ones giving a lot of codeine, hoping that it wouldn't get much respiratory depression from it. And they were most susceptible to respiratory depression. <coughs> so you have to watch out. You're not supposed to give codeine to kids anymore, having TNAs. That's what the FDA's box warning was. Does that make sense? Tramadol is metabolized to its M1 metabolite, which is six times more potent than the parent compound. So one of the metabolizing issues, tramadol, U-L-T-A-M, Alton uh, was is one of the metabolites is more potent than the actual drug. Hydrocodone effectiveness can vary widely depending on the 
genetic status of the patient, which influences how much will bind to the mu receptor. Oxycodone has significant variation depending on the metabolic genotype. So then basically there's different genotypes that change the response to narcotics. I could say that as a general rule. That's true of codeine, it's true of tramadol, it's true of oxycodone, hydrocodone. Some patients are going to respond more or less than you would expect. Now the next uh, CYP3A4 enzyme, fentanyl, buprenorphine, methadone metabolism vary according to the activity of this enzyme. So if they're enzyme induced, they're going to metabolize it faster and the drug's not going to work as well. We see this in surgery. One of the things you're going to notice when you get a little more experience in anesthesia is that one of the drugs that we use that has <coughs> the most variability is the narcotics. Some patients you're given you know, dose after dose after dose to keep them comfortable on the table. The next patient, you give 100 mics of fentanyl and it lasts for three hours. So there's a real wide variation in patients' responses to uh, narcotics. A lot of it has to do with uh, metabolism and genetics. A lot of it has to do with tolerance. People who are drinkers take more and people who may be on certain medications and so on. And we'll, we'll discuss that. Women, uh, farther down, women generally have a higher activity these enzymes, 3B6, which may alter the metabolism of both methadone or propofol. And there are different types of mu and kappa receptor variants in different people that can affect the opiates as well. So there's, yes, question. Does this factor into why people with red hair are a little more resistant to opiates? Maybe. Uh, I'm not sure about they could. I'm sure the reason is genetic. Yes, to answer that way. I don't know specifically the red hair thing. Um, so anyways, I just want to show you that. Now, next little bullet point I want you to write down. I'm going to ask you this. Everybody's going to ask you this. This you need to know. Demerol is metabolized to a toxic metabolite. Demerol, meparidine, the main metabolite of Demerol, it's called normaparidine, N-O-R. In chemistry, nor means no radical. It takes some off, took some radical off of Demerol. Normaparidine is the metabolite. Normaparidine is a CNS toxic. It can cause seizures and other things you don't want to have. Now, that's why, number one, uh, they don't rec well, it's fallen out of favor, there's no question about it, uh, compared to the older days, the use of Demerol. It's still used, but not as frequently. Um, and it's not recommended to use it for longer than a 24-hour period, because after two, three doses, you might build up a lot of metabolites which is toxic. It's also contraindicated, or used <coughs> very cautiously at least, in pa patients with renal disease, because they pee out the metabolite, and if they got renal disease, they can't pee out the metabolite, and they're more susceptible to toxicity. And in the elderly, because the elderly can't pee out the metabolite as fast either. So you're gonna see Demerol listed as counterindicated in patients with renal disease, the elderly, more than maybe one dose or so on, you don't want to give them much. Don't use it for prolonged periods, greater than 24 hours, that's not really related to anesthesia, since we don't have 24-hour patients, but nonetheless. And uh, that's why everybody sticks with uh, morphine instead. So Demerol does have some metabolism issues, that being a, a uh, active metabolism. Now finally, my last bullet, in line with what Demerol, I might as well throw this in here because I just, like I said, I'm just <coughs> throwing it all in the same basket, I'm not sure how to put it, where to put it. And that is, 
there's a very prominent, world-renowned, everybody knows about this, it's been in the books for 30 years, drug interaction that occurs between Demerol and the MAO inhibitors. Any patient that's on an MAO inhibitor cannot be given Demerol. It's an absolute. Everybody's supposed to know that. Now you know it. You probably already know. They can have seizures and severe cardiac side effects and they can die. Now, the MEO inhibitors are not around as much as they used to be in the old days, but they're certainly still around and they have some uses. So a patient who's on the MEO inhibitors uh, for psychiatric reasons, etc., no demerol. Okay. All right, everybody with me on that? Good, let's go to page 229. Two twenty nine. Oh, here's the usual kinetic table for the narcotic drugs with all the different parameters. So let's take a look at this. Thanks to Dr. Hupka from, uh, for making this table up. I gave him due credit. In the first column of the PKAs of the drugs, then he uh, kindly figured out how much is not ionized at that PKA pH, so you can see how much uh, goes in the blood-brain blood barrier. Uh, percent of protein binding, take a look, anything stand out? Uh, Methadone is 90, fentanyl and Sue are 90, the rest are not that bad. Um, oil, uh, lipid solubility, volume distribution, you can see the only thing that stands out is the primary fentanyl. See how small it is, a small volume of distribution. Meaning it's very water soluble, it doesn't really get out of the plasma that much. The small volume of distribution, remember that? Elimination half life, take a look at them. Methadone's long because it's a long acting drug. The rest are in the two to four, three to five hour range. That's pretty standard drugs. There's nothing there that you need to stay awake at night worrying about. But take a look at um, Remifano. That's the one that stands out. The half life is 0.1 hour. What is 0.1 hour? Six minutes. So it's very short. For the same, for the obvious reason. There's the durations, and you see again the durations all are fairly uh, standard. Uh, fentanyl is a little bit shorter, but it's very dependent on the dose you give. But I can give somebody fentanyl and it lasts 30 to 60 minutes. I can give somebody lots of fentanyl and get it to last for eight to 10 hours, depending on how much you give. We're going to talk all about dosing here in a few minutes. So there's some of the kinetic parameters. I don't think there's anything that reaches out and grabs you by the neck. Just some standard pharmacology stuff. And uh, there you go. Now, this figure I showed you before. But I put it in here again. This is on the next page, 230. Because I wanted to remind Remember this one. This is the percent probability of not responding to what you're doing to the patient versus increasing plasma concentrations of alfentanil. It could be any narcotic. It doesn't have to be alfentanil. It could be fentanyl or morphine or whatever. And remember, the skin closure was the least stimulating. 
get an incision was in the middle. Intubation took the highest dose required to make sure there's no response. So we're measuring no response. If you look at EV50 for each of these, EV50 is the highest to block stimulation from intubation. So um, just to remind you that uh, the reason I show this is because I'm going to teach you how to dose or try to suggest how to dose the opiates and try to get the most in in the beginning of the case. So the when it's most stimulating, the skin incision and the intubation, etc., and has the least amount at the end of the case when they're just closing up, because that's not as stimulating. Plus, then you can wake the patient up, get them to breathe, and everything else. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about dosing here in a few minutes. But I just wanted to remind you of that. Now, I, I guess I could even say, let me. Uh, I, I'm trying. One thing I always try to avoid is just assuming everybody knows something. And then I keep remembering, well, maybe you don't have as much familiarity. So don't put your pens down. Just let me talk. When you give an anesthetic, and I think you kind of know this, but in a typical anesthetic, let's pretend I'm going into work today and I'm just going to give anesthesia. Routine day, healthy people, having whatever, some ortho, some general surgery, I don't know, GYN cases, whatever. Pretty routine stuff, and you're likely then going to give pro, uh, Versed pre op, milligram or two, patient's happy, get back in the room, slap on the monitors, propofol, SIVO, fentanyl, rocuronium, that's anesthesia in 2017, <coughs> right? So you're bopping along, the case goes 90 minutes, the average surgery in the US data shows is about 90 minutes, routine procedure nowadays. So you get 90 minutes, two hours, coming near the end, so it's starting to close, you got to wake the patient up. So what, are, what you're thinking is going to be is this. The first thing that's got to go is the muscle relaxer. So you got to reverse the muscle relaxer. So you're either going to use neostigmine or more likely nowadays the Amidex. We'll talk about that next after we do narcotics. And uh, so you're going to reverse the muscle relaxant. And you have to make sure that's all gone. So the patient has enough strength to breathe, move, live, go home, whatever. And then you're going to start turning the gas to SIVO down, or does, or ISO. And you're starting to back off on it. You can read your digital readouts and see if the end expiratory is. You know where the patient is. You want to kind of time it to go along with what the surgeon's finishing up and, uh, and uh, closing the patient up and so on. So you got to get start blowing off the gas, in other words. All right. Then the third drug you need to worry about is the narcotic. And the thing is, the narcotic is the one drug that we try to leave some in there. All right. You want to get get them to blow off the gas because you don't need anesthetic when you go home. Your propofol is all gone by now. Two hours later, it was gone an hour and forty-five minutes ago. At least gone enough the patient's awake because it redistributed. The Versed is not hanging around long enough to bother you. But what is hanging around is the narcotic. And you want to leave some in there because the patient's going to wake up in pain. Most likely, everybody who has surgery has an incision, unless you're doing something, you know, smaller, non invasive procedure. And the incision's going to be so, have them sore, and they're going to want to have uh, some analgesia. So we try to administer the narcotic so that the most is there in the beginning, it's called front loading. It's just like you do with many drugs, you know, you load, give a loading dose followed by a maintenance infusion. We try to simulate that by giving it up front, that's when the painful part of the operation is. And at the end, what you need to know in your brain, you know what you gave, you know how much you gave, you know how the patient's been responding. I've been watching this patient for two hours. If I had to give another 50 mics of fentanyl every 10 minutes because they got tachycardic on me and they were responding and they were light? Or did I give 150 mites of fentanyl in the beginning and it's been just smooth for two hours? The patient's really been, you know, responding well to the dosing I've been giving. Or are they eating it up, just like we say in the coffee room, and they're requiring a higher dose? 
Well, you can know that because you've been there given the anesthetic. So at the end, your gas is going away, the patient's muscle relaxants reversed, you got them eventually on 100% oxygen, and now what about the narcotic? You look in their eyes, are they pinpoint? If they're not pinpoint, their eyes are responding. Is the patient breathing? Of course, you're trying to build up a little CO2 and let them start breathing again. Uh, if they're not breathing, now what? Is it because their CO2 is still low? Well, you got a readout to tell you that. You want to let them be aptic for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, see if they start breathing. Is there still narcotic around? You know when you gave the last dose, you know how much they've been getting. So you need to uh, figure that out. And that's what we have to assess or the way we go about at the end of every case. And you want to get to the point where the patient's breathing okay and you can exudate them and they're safe without having to get rid of all the narcotic. I could easily be a moron and just give Narcan to everybody. Right? I mean, it's, it's, brain, it's brainless. You ever give Narcan to somebody? It works real fast. 45, 60 seconds. It's absolute. It's a great drug. It reverses anything. I have nothing against Narcan. It works well. I wish more drugs worked as well as it does. The problem is, you just reversed all their analgesia. So you gave the narcotic to the point where you gave so much they couldn't breathe at the end. Then you reverse them with Narcan and they're breathing like crazy because now they're in pain because you reverse the respiratory depression, but you also reverse their analgesia because they go hand in hand. They're always the same. So you take the patient to PACU and they're in pain and the PACU nurse is going to be annoyed because the patient's going to move moving around and they're not comfortable. The patient's not going to like it and it's a lousy way to give anesthesia. So we, uh, I don't say we never use Narcan on a patient, but if you're using it more than once a month or, you know, once or twice a month, depending on how cases you're doing, then you got to rethink your technique, right? We consider it a failure when we have to give it. Now, it isn't, you know, I don't go home and beat myself personally or anything, but it's just a point where, you know, I wish I would have known not to give so much to this patient. Now they can't breathe. Now I've got to get Narcan. And you know the patient's going to be reversing their analgesia. So it's kind of a, it's not, it's not the way we like to give anesthesia. It's not a bad thing. It's not malpractice. It's not any of that. It's just not the preferred, you know, wonderful technique where you turn the gas off and the patient opens their eyes and says, oh, thank you, John. <laughs> Let's do lunch. I'll pay my bill as fast as possible. <laughs> they move themselves over on the stretcher. They smile and wave on the way out of the room. <laughs> That's the kind of anesthetic we like. Yeah. You know, uh, when I have to do an arcane and make them in pain, that's the kind I don't like. So anyways, I just want to mention that when we talk about dosing these, that's what we're shooting for. We're shooting for maximum analgesia in the beginning and middle and least amount of analgesia at the end because you don't really need that much at the end and then some residual narcotic on board, but not enough to make them respiratory depressed. That's the world you all have lived in, your whole nursing career, right? Somebody called you and said, give me a shot for pain, and you gave them a shot for pain, you didn't make them stop breathing, so you got them to a blood level where they were analgesic, but there wasn't enough to make them not breathe, and that's, that's the ideal. Well, that's what we try to get at the very end of the case, down to the doses that usual people use. Not the interoperative doses that only people like us use. Okay, let's take a break. Now, the, the general effects of the opiates are listed on the bottom of page 230. And I want to spend a little time going through some of these. So we'll start with analgesia. We've already gone through it, so that's easy. The opiates produce analgesia by stimulating opiate receptors, which are on pain in the pain pathway on pain neurons, which causes a decrease in the release of pain producing neurotransmitters, and that produces analgesia. So that was easy. The next thing we're gonna talk about is respiratory depression. So let's go to page 240. Page 240. And of course, the respiratory depression is the big kahuna 
for the opiate side effects, and that's the most undesirable and the one that limits the amount we can give, how often we can give it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's take a look at this. This is on page 240, and then I'll show you on the next page too. Um, this is what's called a CO2 response curve. Now that's funny because it's not a curve. But that's never stopped me before. Everybody calls it that, but even it's just expressed uh, as a straight line because they don't put it this on a log scale. But uh, let's read what the fellow wrote here. Respiratory CO2 response curve obtained before and one hour after 10, 10 milligrams of IM morphine. <coughs> Equianalgesic doses of opiates produce the equivalent changes and displace the CO2 response curve to the right. All right, so you've all done this a million times, right? Patient, I'm a nurse, I'm in pain, 10 milligrams of morphine, hit them with an uh, injection, now they're feeling better. All right, this is pretty routine stuff in medicine. So what they're showing here is before and after 10 milligrams of morphine, I am. This is one hour after. So this is the normal CO2 response line, I'll call it a curve. And what does this mean? We're plotting the alveolar ventilation versus what your PCO2 is, because your CO2 drives respiration. So here's your CO2 is 40, and you're breathing at about, I don't know, I'll eyeball it. Is that five liters per minute alveolar ventilation? Everybody see that? And if your CO2 goes up, now here's the CO2 of 50, and if you go up, You'd be breathing this fast, and the CO2 is 60, and so on. So you're going to breathe faster and deeper the more higher your CO2 goes. Now you got 10 milligrams of morphine. You go back an hour later and check your CO2 and their response. And what do you see? Well, now to keep the same 5 liters per minute, it took me a CO2 of what? 48, maybe, 47 somewhere right here. So, pharmacology, we would say this. The opiates are respiratory depressants because they shift the CO2 response curve to the right, which is just a fancy way of saying they cause respiratory depression. But that's how they use, the, that's the lingo they use, the science lingo. Shifts the CO2 response curve to the right. It takes a higher CO2 to drive the same amount of respiration. Now, this patient's fine. They're breathing normally. And like I said, you've done this to patients a million times. Give them a shot of morphine. And you go back, and they're breathing fine, and they feel good, and they're analgesic, and so on. But underlying all that, if you measured their PCO2, it would actually be 48 or 50. It's higher. And then as the drug wears off, the CO2 response curve moves back towards normal. Let's look at it again. Next page. Same kind of situation. Page 241. And let's get it on camera here. Let's read the caption. CO2 response curve, again, a straight line, from one subject to receive four doses of morphine. They got 10 milligrams IV at 40 minute intervals. So first of all, to start out with, this is no drug around this first line. This is the PCO2 40, alveolar ventilation was about five, six liters per minute. So that's normal, that's a normal, non-drugged. This is 10 milligrams of morphine, 40 minutes later, 10 milligrams, 40 minutes later, 10 milligrams, 40 minutes later, 10 milligrams. What do you see? Well, every time the morphine is given, they're less responsive to CO2 driving their respirations. It's taking a, let's, let's do this one here. By the fourth dose, it's taking a 53, 54 PCO2 
to drive the same amount of respirations prior to giving any dose. Everybody see that? How I figured that out? Just extrapolated it. So morphine is shifting the CO2 response curve to the right. The more you give, if you kept going, I kept giving you this 10 milligram of morphine thing, <coughs> this is what you'd see. <coughs> no, if you'd be quiet. Eventually you'd give enough that it stop breathing. You'd flatten it out. So, we come back to the end of the case in my little scenario I talked to before the break. You try to wake the patient up. You look in the patient's eyes, uh, they're a little bit pinpoint, some meiosis, but not real bad. They respond to light a little bit, so they got some narcotic around, but you're kind of not sure. So you stop breathing. Take them off the ventilator, open up your pop off valve, you let the bag just fill up. And you just sit. You want to let your CO2 rise. Why? Because maybe their CO2 has to go up to 50 to get them breathing. When the CO2, every once in a while, you gotta squeeze the bag because then otherwise you can't register your CO2. But you know, every 30 seconds or so, you'll squeeze. You'll see if the PCO2 is ran title in the case of our machines, and then see where you stand. If this patient's CO2 went up to 55, 60, I'm not sure I'd let it go that high, but if it got up in the mid-50s and there was still no breathing, this is what I would do. Call, pack you, and order a ventilator because you're not going to be able to get this patient up. Or you can touch them with a little Narcan. All right, we'll show you how to do that. But if they don't respond and their CO2 gets up to 55, 60, there's too much narcotic around for them to to breathe. The opiates depress the respiratory center in the brainstem, their response to CO2. Or another way to say it is they shift the CO2 response curve to the right. All right. Does everybody follow me on that? So, you can have normal respirations, but you're going to suffer a higher CO2. And if it, as long as it isn't too much higher, then that's the way life is. Every time you give somebody a narcotic, their CO2 goes up, even if they're still breathing fine. And so if it goes up to 45 or 47 or 48, that's okay. I can live with that. More importantly, they can live with that, and they can be fine. Give too many doses, and you're going to flatten it out to zero. Okay. So, everybody with me on that one? Now, in the last one, next page, page 242. Oh, I just threw this in here. I don't know why. It's not that exciting. But this is a percent of control slope. They're looking at the slope of the CO2 response curve over time. And this is post-operatively. So, or in Andrew and post-operatively. So here's the first after your last dose of fentanyl, and then they do it at the end of surgery. Then when you get into PACU, they're looking at the patient's CO2 response. And you see that it's pretty good. When you get to, uh, it's 100% here. When you got to PACU, the patient was breathing fine. Then you put a nice warm blanket on them, whisper sweet nothings in their ear, <laughs> give them something for pain. You walk away and don't bother them, and all of a sudden their respirations go down because they're kind of going back to sleep. So this is post op, and then finally they wake up and go home. So they're just showing that the patients, once they're comfortable in the you, sometimes slow down their breathing a little bit because they're not being stimulated. Um, it's, it's not a major thing, but there you go. Okay, so. Back to the respiratory depressant effect of the opiates, and I'll summarize my final statement by saying this. Narcotics depress respirations, of course, that's one of their most prominent actions, and they do it by depressing the respiratory center sensitivity to carbon dioxide. 
or another way to say it is they produce a shift in the CO2 response curve to the right. Or they just produce respiratory depression. Say whatever you want. Now, I'll uh, go back to uh, my page uh, 230 in the defects. So we did analgesia and respiratory depression. They produce sedation and euphoria. The opiates, of course, uh, morphine was named for the fact that it produces euphoria. And for most patients, like, as I mentioned yesterday, occasionally some patients get a bad feeling from it. They don't like the way they feel. And they get dysphoria. Uh, but most people are euphoric and sedate. But sedation is different than anesthesia. So I want to point out again, all the books will point out, and everyone else you run around in class will point out, that you can't put somebody to sleep with narcotics. You've got to give an anesthetic, too. And the patients who have uh, awareness under anesthesia, which does happen in a small percent, are generally people who are getting a lot of narcotics, so they're Vital signs are nice, a nice low heart rate, and nice blood pressure because they're analgesic. But they're not anesthetic, they're not asleep, they're paralyzed, they don't move. They're comfortable because they've got lots of narcotics around. But if you're not giving at least nitrous oxide, if not a little bit of gas on top of it, then you're not going to have guaranteed the patients to sleep. So they produce sedation, euphoria, but not anesthesia. Okay, the next thing is they produce vasodilation or bradycardia. So let me mention this. In other words, we can broaden this out by saying, what are the cardiac effects of the narcotics? And here's the answer. Most opiates have pretty much minimal effect on the heart. All right? They don't really drop your blood pressure. They cause bradycardia. For reasons we'll talk about, they have a vagal effect on the heart. We'll get into that. And the histamine releasing ones can cause vasodilation. Because histamine causes vasodilation. So, well, Johnny, how come when the patient's blood pressure goes up, I give somebody fentanyl? I thought you said it doesn't make blood pressure go down. Well, it doesn't really. What you're doing is treating the the pain and the stimulation, the patient's perceiving in the middle of the case, stimulation from the surgeon. And once you suppress the stimulation or cause analgesia, then the blood pressure comes back down again. So it's not really causing hypotension per se. What you're doing is you're treating the pain, therefore the analgesia is letting the patient settle back down and have a nice blood pressure. See the difference? Now, you can also say, well, gee, I was not working on the floor, and I gave a patient narcotic, and they sat up and wanted to walk to the bathroom, and their blood pressure dropped to 80, and they fell over and hit their head, and I had to fill out an incident report. What's up with that? I thought you said the blood pressure doesn't go down. Well, it can produce orthostatic hypotension. That's what the postural hypotension. That's what it's called, orthostatic. When you change positions. If you give a histamine-releasing opiate, like morphine or clotted or one of those you give on the floor, then when the patient sits up, changes position because of the vasodilation, blood can pull in their leg, they get a little woozy, and they knock their head on the side rail or something. That's not really making the patient's blood pressure go down. That's just because of uh, changes in posture. All right? So, if you lay still, if you're well hydrated, and you lay flat on a table, well, that's our patients, right? They don't, they're not walking around in this surgery. They're laying flat on a table, they're hopefully well hydrated, or we're about to get them that way. And uh, you give them opiates, you don't expect the blood pressure to really change. And you'll see. But what does happen is bradycardia. We do get a slow heart rate, and we love that. Nothing wrong with bradycardia. You can, it's going to be your friend for the rest of your life. <coughs> Every time the heart rate's in the 50s, you just smile. <laughs> the little computers bopping along, the railroad tracks, you know, nice, even. Got a lot of it. So, produce cardiac effects are bradycardia, 
not much effect on blood pressure as long as the patient's supine and hydrated and fairly normal. And then uh, ones that do cause histamine release, you can get some vasodilation from the histamine. All right, the next thing that's listed here is, is cough suppression. So go to page 240. We'll talk about that. This is easy. In pharmacology, we call it an antitussive effect, page 240. Cough suppression means antitussive. So it's listed here at the bottom of page 240. Antitussive effects of the opioids. And they're saying that heroin is same as fentanyl, is the same as, as uh, hydromorphine, is the same as hydrocodone, then methadone, codeine, morphine, uh, who cares? Here's the point. Narcotics suppress cough. They all do it. And they all do well. And they do it pretty well. Too. We like that. We like it because when the patients wake up, they don't cough on emergence as much. They tolerate the endotracheal tube better. If you give a cough suppressant type drug, which like an opiate. So not coughing is good for us. Good for the patient too. So they're all antitussive. I don't really care which one's more, which one's less. It's all gonna be dose dependent anyways. Just know that they depress the cough center in the brain and they all produce an antitussive effect. And that's the standard action of the uh, the opiates. <coughs> okay, the next thing on my little list here in, uh, is uh, meiosis. So let's go to, well, what's next? Yeah, meiosis. So let's go to, I get it in here somewhere. Page 245. Oh, that's muscle rigidity. Yeah, page 245. Ocular effects. So let's talk about the ocular eye effects. Now, first of all, there's two things. Opiates, this is a very famous effect of opiates, and that is you never develop tolerance to two of the actions of opiates. The my meiosis, no matter how long you've been taking narcotics, if you're a heroin addict and you've been a heroin addict for 10 years, every time you take a dose, you're going to get pinpoint pupils. You never develop tolerance to that and to the constipation effect, <laughs> unfortunately. So the two effects that you never develop tolerance. So in our patients, we can always count on looking in the eyes and seeing pinpoint pupils if the patient's pretty narcotized. Uh, so let's take a look. Pop of page 245. Morphine in most mu and kappa agonists cause constriction of the pupil by an excitatory action on the parasympathetic nerve intervening the pupil. So it's a parasympathomimetic effect of the drug on the pupils. The opiates abolish cortical inhibition in the edinger westfall nucleus, resulting in pupillary constriction. After the IV administration of morphine, there's a 26% decrease in pupil diameter. And the other ones as well. The uh, second paragraph, fentanyl, Su, Al, and Remy, and so on, can prevent increases in intraocular pressure by suppressing the pain response and so on. So the opiates, cause pinpoint pupils, 
they do it because of a legal effect or parasympathomimetic effect, whatever word you want to use, on the eye via the ocular motor nerve through the energy of Westfall nucleus. They also decrease interocular pressure. So that's the, the eye effects of, of uh, the opiate. All right, the next one, I might as well do it while I'm on this page. Talk about shivering a little bit. And we've mentioned it several times, and sure everybody else has too, that this is an issue postoperatively. Waking patients up, their temperature fell during the case, and they're shivering, and we don't like it because it raises their need, demand for oxygen, and uh, so they may be more susceptible to hypoxia. One of the ways to get rid of shivering is to use Demerol, specific to Demerol only, and we use a dose of 10 milligrams. So let's read this. Opiate-based anesthesia probably reduces the thermal regulatory threshold to an extent similar to that of the gas anesthetics. Demerol is unique among the opiates in its ability to effectively terminate Shivering. Anti-shivering effect is primarily related to a reduction in shivering threshold and is mediated by Demerol's action on kappa receptors. Boy, do I see a question there. For test three. <laughs> which narcotic can cause an anti-shivering effect and which receptor is involved? You could write these tests. Then. Sure. Demol exerts agonist activity. At the uh, alpha rece adrenal receptors suggesting possible involvement as well. So it works by kappa receptors. It's anti-shivering, and met they mentioned the fact that it's also possibly has something to do with alpha two receptors because Presidex does the same thing, and a lot of people are using Presidex now to suppress shivering, although it's an expensive drug, rather than Demerol because uh, people are hesitant to use narcotics in PACU you because you're trying to wake the patient up, get them out of the hospital, and you, you, know, you don't want to give them sedatives when you're trying to wake them up. But nonetheless. Okay. And lastly, since we're on this page, let's talk about the pruritus. Uh, intrathecal uh, spinal morphine induced itching is suggested to be mediated by the new receptor. That's not going to get you a Nobel Prize right there. <laughs> Narcan reverses opiate induced itching. This finding supports that it's a new uh, action. And opiate antagonists are non ideal therapeutic drugs to treat the paritis. Why not? Because you're reversing the patient's analgesia. So, even though they work, perhaps some mixed opioids with low to medium efficacy, like buprenorphine, can be used. Nalbifene, butorphanol, or antipyretics, because they partially antagonize the mu receptor. Recently, Zofran on Dancetron is proposed for treatment. Some people use droperidol, small doses of droperidol. Some people have used propofol. It seems to have a decent itching, anti-itching effect. You give 10 milligrams of propofol. Uh, so there's a lot of drugs floating around that people are proposing. Um, histamine release, once thought to underline this phenomenon, is not causative because it's caused by non-histamine releasing opiates as well. So it's not the fact, it doesn't have to only happen with histamine drugs, it happens with all of them. Facial itching may not be necessarily a manifestation of direct opiate action. It may reflect opiate-triggered neurotransmission at a distant site. So patients who get opiates, especially by unconventional routes, such as spinal, epidural, PCAs, infusions that post-operatively, they're pushing the little button, and they can get itching. 
Every anesthesia department in the United States has a written protocol for how do you deal with itching from the opiates. So if you're in the pain service and happen to work in a hospital, and you're covering pain service that day, and you're doing rounds on patients post-op, we've all got their little buttons and their analgesic uh, infusions going, and you're going to run into patients that are itching, and you, every department has sat down and put their heads together and come up with it, what they believe are, will be a good protocol for treating that, which will include all these types of drugs. Propofol, droperidol, Zofran, uh, some narcotic antagonists, uh, Bupinex. So you can have different ones. You see it in different places. When all else fails, you can give them uh, Narcan, but again, rem reminding yourself that you're reversing the patient's analgesia. You could all then have to give an, an NSAID or something that's a different method of analgesia. Okay. Good. All right, now the next thing I want to talk about is biliary pressure. So that's, we're going to 246 for that. Page 246. Okay, here's the story. You're going to memorize this. I memorized it when I was a student. Everybody who studied anesthesia has all memorized the same thing. You can't be in the club unless you memorize this. All right? It probably doesn't matter. It's, it's just a classroom thing. But nonetheless, you're going to memorize it. Your kids, when they come through here, are going to memorize it. Everybody's going to memorize it. Here's what happens. And this part's true. Narcotics increase biliary pressure. All right, what happens is they have a vagal effect on sphincters in your body. Now, your biliary tree, your gallbladder drainage, etc., runs through your bile system, ducts, and so on. And the outlet sphincter for releasing bile out of your bile ducts off towards the uh, towards the toilet will be uh, is called the sphincter of ODI ODI. And the sphincter of ODI is the outlet sphincter for the for biliary flow. And the narcotics, because they're vagal, they affect sphincters, they tighten them up. So you get urinary retention, because the urinary sphincters get tight, the patients come back from surgery, what have you always done as a nurse? You gotta make sure they go to the bathroom and they can void, right? Because a lot of times at the end of after surgery, given a lot of narcotics and plus for other reasons as well, they have a hard time peeing po initially post op. And uh, so that's one of the reasons. And it also has to do with biliary pressure. So if you contract that outlet sphincter, you build up bile volume, therefore pressure, and you can produce biliary colic. So uh, what, what it means is, if you look in a lot of uh, medical books, <coughs> pharmacology especially, they talk about like a patient coming to ER with biliary or renal colic, and they'll say they don't recommend giving an opiate for the pain. Instead, try to use an NSAID or you know, some other method, because sometimes it makes it worse. So the patient's got biliary colic, and you cause an increase in biliary pressure, that's not going to really cure them. So you'll sometimes see that in books. Uh, that's outside the OR. Now, what happened inside the OR is this. In the old days, we used to do gallbladders open. And uh, what happens is uh, the surgeon would, for diagnostic reasons, open the patient up, expose the gallbladder, and then thread a little PE catheter into the biliary system and inject dye and then do x-rays. That's called a cholangiogram. And you'll see, if you look at the chalkboard and the boarding in the morning, you know, I'm in room eight and we're doing a cholecystectomy with cholangiogram. And that means the surgeon's gonna inject dye into the biliary tree. They're looking for tumors, blockages, stones, it's a diagnostic tool to help them see where the stoppage is so they can kind of help uh, treat the patient. 
And uh, we used to do it a lot more. They don't do it as often as much, but nonetheless, they do it. Now, what happened was, in the old days, because we use a lot of narcotics, it was felt that the narcotics would cause an increased biliary pressure, and you couldn't do a valid cholangiogram because it was messing up the flow of the dye, the uh, radiopaque dye, and the surgeon wasn't getting a good x-ray picture, and uh, so they couldn't make a nice diagnosis. So we always had to learn this. Look on page 246, in the bottom of the page. Uh, if the surgeon was going to say that they couldn't do the glandiogram because of the narcotics, then you have some choices. You're going to memorize this. I'm going to ask you this in the next test. You're going to spit it right back to me just like that. All right? Number one thing you could do. You can give atropine or, or robinol. Why? Because it's a vagal effect. And of course, these are anticholinergic, antivagal drugs, right? So you could give some robinol. That would hopefully open the sphincter. If that doesn't work, you get a little bit bigger gun out. And you could give some nitroglycerin. You could put a nice nitro tab on the patient's tongue, even if they're asleep and intubated, it doesn't matter. And the nitroglycerin, of course, is an excellent smooth muscle relaxant. And we relax the gallbladder, the biliary tree, that could solve the problem. If that doesn't work, you can inject some glucagon. Glucagon is uh, used quite often by the uh, endoscopists when they're trying to thread their little catheters in the intestines and all of the various places. It makes them open up, relax. And then finally, when all dust settles, if all, none of that worked, you could give Narcan, because of course that reverses all the narcotic problems. Now, the only problem with that, you're in the middle of the case and you're giving Narcan, and they get, you haven't even finished the surgery yet. That's kind of a problem. Nonetheless, that goes from a minimal effect to the, you know, maximum effect, those four drugs. So you got to learn it. Now, here's what happens. Nowadays, they do lap coles. You do them in about 25 minutes, 20 minutes, and they just go in and rip the whole thing out. There's nothing <laughs> finesse about it. They burn and rip, burn and rip, take it out, done, 20 minutes. So uh, the clansy gram is kind of, you know, it's a classroom thing. They still do them once in a while, but the surgeons are aware that we're giving narcotics. They don't seem, it doesn't seem to be an issue. They can still get a valid defloscopy, whatever they're doing. And uh, so we know what happens. Um, they know what happens. We're supposed to know how to treat it, although I haven't seen this done in 25 years. Question. Um, so if they, if they constrict sphincters, why do they have a... Uh, decrease in sphincter tone on lower esophageal sphincter. Opiates. They relax. Yeah. That's, uh, it's different in the uh, gastric than it is, because they're less smooth muscle. They're more skeletal muscle. So the upper and lower esophageal sphincters behave differently than pure smooth muscle sphincters. So they have different responses to drugs. How does the glucagon work again? Glucagon is, um, it just has a hormonal effect that relaxes smooth muscle and opens up for sphincters. Now let's look at, I'm going to go on the camera, page 246. This is a classic, I think it's in every anesthesia textbook I've ever seen. This is a study that was done way back in 1984. And they're showing, uh, what are they doing? Uh, percent of control of biliary pressure uh, versus time in minutes. So the percent change in common bile duct pressure versus time of several opiates. Patients undergoing cholecystectomy uh, with the ethrine anesthesia, after 20 minutes they were reversed with Narcan. So this is the biliary pressure, and you see this is fentanyl, this is second line was morphine, the third line is Demerol, 
and it seems to be related to potency. The more potent it is, the higher the biliary pressure goes, see? Benzoyl is more potent than morphine, morphine more than Demerol. Uh, Butorphanol is an agonist antagonist, so it didn't go up as much. Then finally, placebo, and it stayed pretty flat. Is that dose dependent as well? Yes, dose and potency dependent, both. And then they said that the, after 20 minutes, they gave Narcan, and look what happens. It comes back to zero at all. So the bottom line of this story is this. Let's summarize it. The opiates raise biliary pressure. They do it by causing constriction of the sphincter of odi, the outflow sphincters in the biliary tree, and therefore you get an increased bile volume, which in turn increases bile pressure. The effect is uh, both dose and, and potency related and uh, it can cause biliary colic in patients who already have it and so on. And if you ever wanted to treat it, which God knows you don't see why you would, but nonetheless, if you did, you would start with the weakest, the least disruptive treatment, which would be to give some robinol or atropine. If that didn't work, nitroglycerin, then glucagon, and finally narcan. That's the end of that story. Is there a tolerance? Uh, yes, you develop tolerance to the biliary effects. Yep. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's do one more and I'll call it a day. And I want to do is one last one and that's called uh, the effect of chest wall rigidity. So go to page 243. This is an anesthetic phenomenon. This only happens to the anesthesia folks, so let's take a look. Now, a strange phenomenon can happen when you're dosing opiates. And uh, you can see on the top, they call it, in a lot of books, they'll call it muscle rigidity, um, uh, also known as chest wall rigidity. You know, most of the people in anesthesia just call it a tight chest. Here's what happens. When you're giving high potency narcotics, that's us, right? Fentanyl, Sufentanyl, et cetera. And you're giving them fast, that's us. We give everything fast. For us, giving something slow means 20 seconds instead of 10 seconds. So you're injecting high potency narcotics quickly. What can happen is the patient gets a spasm of their chest wall and their glottis, et cetera. It just spasms up, the muscles do. They can't breathe, you can't ventilate them with a mask or an LMA or whatever, endotracheal tube, they just can't be ventilated. Obviously that would be a, um, an emergency situation, but since it happens right in front of us in the OR, and we're putting someone to sleep, we're standing there with a rendoscope in your hand when it's happening, then it's not that big a deal, you can just treat it. Paralyze them with sucks the colon and it goes away. So it's a potential problem, but in the real world, it's not really an issue to us. We see it, we know it happened. You can treat it by giving sucks the colon and 30 seconds later intubate them and you're all set. Put a mask or whatever. So let's take a look. Page 243. Muscle rigidity is a strange and not well defined complication associated with the administration of narcotics. The reported incidence has been variable. Some people believe it almost never happens. Others say we, we just mistake it for something else. Or it may happen during induction, but because we hurry up, we hurry up and hit them with propofol, then narcotics, then sucks. We never even notice that it happened because we paralyze them so fast. Others believe it occurs with the majority of high-dose narcotic techniques, but it's not frequently recognized. When do we see it? So these are the parameters when it's most common. The dose of narcotic, when you're given high doses, that is you say you're using Sufenta, very potent, the most potent narcotic, you're using high doses of it, you've got an infusion running and you're dosing it out of the syringe, giving it fast. If you're also using nit nitrous oxide, it's more common in the older people. 
And of course, it's going to be evident if they're not paralyzed. If you use muscle relaxants, you're not going to see it. So those are the um, associated parameters. Uh, in addition, there's some data that suggests rigidity occurs only after loss of consciousness. So what the reason they're saying that is if the patient gets this chest wall rigidity, a tight chest, then you can be sure they're unconscious. So just paralyze them. It's not like you're going to be paralyzing them awake. So just go ahead and give sucks, give your acuronium, whatever you're using, and you're all set. Uh, alpha and ranifentanil seem to cause the greatest incidence, especially when given in large and rapid doses. Do you see a pattern here? Every sentence says large doses rapidly. <laughs> so that's kind of the parameters here. High potency, large doses rapidly given. Why is this a problem? Well, obviously rigidity, thoracic muscles can impair ventilation. In addition, glottic closure prevents proper ventilation. Uh, how does this occur? About on page 243. Precise mechanism is not understood. It's not due to a direct action on the muscles since the muscle relaxants can treat it. Multiple sites in the CNS may be proposed, so nobody knows why. How should it be treated? Bottom of page 243. Sucks will quickly result in muscle relaxation for the patients who experience rigidity. In addition, many advocate the use of a non-depolarizer as a pretreatment to prevent this problem. So, there you go. Now, on the next page, 244, this I took out of Dr. Miller's, and I, you can take a look at this yourself. Um, I'll look at the uh, second paragraph here. It just is his take on the muscle rigidity. It's page 244. And the second uh, paragraph, precise mechanism causes is not understood. Um, he talks about various receptors being involved. Pretreatment or concomitant use of non depolarizers significantly decreases the incidence and severity. So, use muscle relaxants, it goes away, basically. It's not going to happen anywhere but when you're already ready to go and start the induction, because that's when you start to give high doses very rapidly. If you do, you're doing a big case, say you're doing a big you know, a radical neck procedure or a Whipple procedure, you're going to load the patient up with a high dose of Sufenta because the case is going to last 10 or 12 hours. You want it to ride out nice and smooth. So you're hurrying up, you're injecting 50 mics, 50 mics, 50 mics, and all of a sudden the patient gets a tight chest. So just go ahead and give them sucks. 30 seconds later, intubate them, and you won't even barely break a stride uh, going through it. But then, anyways, I want you to hear about it, know about it. It's called tight chest, and that's what it is. Okay, that's enough for today. See you next week.